Calvary's a mountain One day they nailed him To die on the tree Suffering anguish Despised and rejected Bearing our sins My Redeemer is he One day the grave could Conceal him no longer One day the stone rolled Away from the door Then he arose or Death he had conquered And now is ascended My Lord evermore Living he loved me Dying he saved me Buried he carried My sins far away
in the valley low I will fear no evil You'll never let me go You'll never let me go Sunday morning uh, and, and worshiping God with you and, and being encouraged by our brothers and sisters, also worshiping God all together. Uh, I do want to draw your attention to the e-bulletin that we are sending out. Uh, not anything specific, but we do have a lot of uh, announcements, a lot of things that are happening here this summer and then coming up to the fall, especially with the move coming up. Uh, so be looking at that for information about different ways that you can be involved uh, in these events and, and ways that you can help out in those way areas. Uh, if you are not getting that uh, via email, you can talk to Renee or send her an email and she can get you signed up for that uh, mailing list. Or you can download our app. It's right there on the, uh, the homepage of the app and you can, um, that's updated weekly so you'll be able to know what's going on, uh, what's going on there. The Rose on the Piano is for a little girl named Vera Lothringer, uh, who was born to Broderick and Haley Lothringer uh, this past week. So uh, be thinking of them. They have a little boy as well. So be thinking of them as they've added now a little girl uh, to their family and just that whole transition that takes place. Uh, if you would like, uh, let me to back up. We have uh, quite a few babies that are going to be born here in the upcoming months. And so we as a church family like to provide meals for those parents and those families who have new kids. And so we have a lot of those coming up. And if you would like to be involved in that ministry, you can also talk to Renee, that meal ministry, or uh, if, you, if you know 
uh, Bonnie Smith. Uh, she kind of heads up that meal ministry. So if you'd like to be put on that list, uh, we would love to uh, have you be involved in that way. And if you're already in, on that list and involved in that way, thank you so much for that. I know as a recipient of some of those meals, they are amazing. So thank you for that. Let's stand as we uh, begin our morning with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for um, today. We thank you for the independence and the freedom that we have in this country and the blessings uh, that you've given us uh, here. We pray now as we uh, turn in and worship you and focus our hearts and minds on you, we pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to do that, would help us to remain focused on you through this, through this service and, and as we go out. Uh, through this holiday weekend, that we would be able to share the blessings and the gifts that you've given us with those around us uh, in a very meaningful way. And God, we thank you for this time of dedicated worship that we have set aside to worship you. And we pray that we wouldn't waste this time, but that we would be uh, fully engaged uh, through all the aspects of the service uh, in worshiping you. We thank you for this time. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship, worship our God this morning. Of a thousand burning suns blazing in the heavens, there is only one, he is our God. Who commands the nations, building up and tearing down, silencing his rivals, there is only one, he is our God.
our God is a holy God. Amen? Amen. First John 4. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. For you and holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who 
Yeah, you may be seated. It's a wonderful song to lead us to the communion table this morning. As we worship together, we have an opportunity to reflect back on our Savior's sacrifice for us and His willingness, of course, to go to the cross. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says this, But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm sure you're as grateful as I am that God didn't say to us, Get your life cleaned up and uh, come back in a couple of weeks or a month or a year. Instead, He demonstrates His love for us, His amazing, faithful love to us, that while we were still in need of a Savior, Jesus died for us. I appreciate the verses that Amber read just a few minutes ago, reflecting on God's love for us in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, and then the call that He has placed on our lives, of course, to love one another. It was Jesus that told His disciples that. Remember in the upper room, as they are experiencing that time with the Lord, and this is just hours before He goes to Gethsemane and ultimately to the cross and lays down His life for us. But He instructs these men that they are to love one another. And He told them in a prophetic statement, I think, right? Greater love has no one than this, that He lays down His life for His friend. Of course, that is indeed what Jesus did and was about to do for not only His disciples, but for us as well. As we come to the communion table this morning, I encourage you to bow your heads and your hearts before the Lord and to thank Him for His faithful love in your life. It's a love that never fades, it doesn't change. It's constant, it's always there, faithfully serving you. Let's thank Him for that. Father, how grateful we are that your love came to us first so that we would know then how to love you. We would understand what real love is. We're so grateful for a verse like Romans 5, 8 that tells us that you have shown us your love by the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, by sending your only Son. Our minds go to John 3.16 that tells us that you love the world so much that you gave your son, your unique son. You gave them for each one of us here. You gave him for the world. Your love is poured out to us in so many ways. and We see it most clearly, dramatically on the cross. When we were your enemies, Jesus Christ died in our place, paid the penalty for our sin paid the debt in full so that by faith in him we might have his righteousness we might be able to stand before you complete in every way set free rejoicing in who we are in our savior and confident absolutely confident of your faithful enduring love in our lives thank you that it doesn't change even though life circumstances change though our world changes Father we thank you that your love is, is a constant in our lives it doesn't ever change day by day we have the opportunity to experience it afresh thank you for that thank you for our time here at this table and for the privilege of being able to come as brothers and sisters in the Lord to, to reflect upon that amazing love that caused our Savior to come to a cross and give us life for each one of us here. Father, we thank you for the wonderful gospel message, the truth of that good news that whoever places their faith in Jesus is indeed saved forevermore, securely in your family. And as your children, we come to this table and we rejoice in it today. We worship you. We submit ourselves again to you and reminded again of the call you have upon our lives to live 
in a righteous way, holy, poured out for you. May that be true for our heart's attitude, our desire, our actions. May we honor you in what we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll ask the men that are going to serve us this morning to come. Father, we thank you for this simple reminder of the amazing love that was demonstrated toward us as you sent Jesus. And Jesus willingly placed himself there on that cross and died for us. We rejoice in that, knowing what it means for us that his body was sacrificed. He paid the penalty for us. Let's eat together.
up, we give thanks again for the simple reminder of such a profound truth that the lifeblood of Jesus was poured out for each one of us, willingly shed so that we might experience freedom from sin and an eternal life with you. We thank you that that's our, our destiny, that that's what's been promised because of our faith in Jesus as our Savior. Let's drink together. to you. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, <clears throat> to Proverbs chapter 14. If you find that, we will come there shortly. During these summer months, we've spent some of our Sundays together in this Old Testament book of Proverbs. Today, we find ourselves there again, looking at a number of different Proverbs. As you find your place there, let me remind you that if you're here and <clears throat> you haven't, you're, you're a guest or maybe a return guest, we take delight in having you with us on this 4th of July weekend. Thankful for each one of you that are able to worship with us. You'll find uh, in front of you a card that enables you to just share a little bit about yourself if you're comfortable in doing that. You can drop that at the information center afterwards or you can use the, your, eye, your uh, smartphone to do the same, I guess, if you'd like to do that electronically. We Again, thank you for coming. I invite you to come again if you're in the Omaha area. And then let me remind you as well of something you may have seen on the screen before the beginning of the service, and that is Connect 22. I don't know if that means anything to you at this point, but it is um, our fellowship of churches that comes together on an annual basis. It's called Connect, and then whatever the year is, in this case, it's Connect 22, and it's happening here in Omaha. You may remember three years ago, we had the opportunity to host it, and uh, that took place right here at CBC. This year, it's back in Omaha. Actually, this is the first year we've done it since we hosted it here three years ago uh, because of the pandemic. And so it's just an opportunity to be a part of something bigger than just our church family. If you'd like to, do, uh, to kind of get a feel for what that schedule looks like, there are uh, copies of the week's schedule on the Information Center desk there. You can grab one before you leave or simply go to the church's website, our website, and you'll find the full schedule there. There's evening sessions that, as I understand it, are going to be um, uh, live streamed. And so if you just wanted to watch at home the evening session and take in the guest speaker, you can do that as well and uh, be a part of things and learn uh, the various things that are being shared about our fellowship and to encourage those within our fellowship, of course, to live for the Lord. So a reminder that Connect 22 is this week. Well, you have your Bible open to the book of Proverbs. We want to ask and answer a question today that probably has been, well, it's not uncommon this weekend, 4th of July weekend, for us to ask a question like this. What makes a nation great is the question I'm asking. And I want to answer that from the book of Proverbs. Um, I think probably great is one of those English words that we use too much. Is that right? I mean, everything from great pizza to a great team uh, are a part of our vocabulary. Um, I think I'll get nauseous if I hear about uh, the goat discussion, which is the greatest of all time, right? There's always some discussion going on about who is the greatest of all time in whatever sport or activity we're talking about. It's called GOAT, and um, it's a discussion that will go on until the end of time, I think. Uh, or maybe you just use it in terms of referring to somebody that you really appreciate. Oh, well, he's a great guy. Oh, she's terrific, Al. She's great. That would be a part of our vocabulary, I think. We oftentimes, of course, and again, especially this time of year, are a part of asking the question or maybe thinking together about whether the United States of America would actually be considered a great nation. I think for many of us, we might think about it this way. Well, it certainly was at one point, but I'm not sure it is today, right? I mean, because we see the things that are happening in our world and particularly our nation. 
Greatness, uh, well, I suppose it depends on, on how you're determining that, right? What standard are you using? If we uh, just kind of give a general thought to that and ask people that today, they might suggest that the United States is a great nation. After all, we are this incredible military power. What would be a greater nation than the United States when it comes to military prowess today? Be hard-pressed to find one that has greater strength than we do as a nation. And so we would say we're a great nation in that sense. Or maybe it's simply the influence we have in the world. Um, you know, as, as we do things, oftentimes the world follows. We are a leader for good and for bad, oftentimes for bad in these days, for the world in which we live. Or the opportunity for our citizens. People continue to clamor to come to the United States. They will do amazing things to get here because they recognize the opportunities are unique as they live in this country compared to other countries. You simply don't hear stories of people trying to get into Haiti or Cuba or Russia. Those stories don't exist. But people do dangerous, oftentimes foolish things to try and make their way to this country. Oftentimes, of course, it's material possessions, right? It's what we have that determines how we answer that question. And while the United States isn't the most wealthy com uh, country in the world, it certainly is one of the wealthiest. And again, the opportunity and then ultimately the freedom that we have in this country oftentimes brings us to the place where we would say, yes, the United States of America is the greatest country in the world. Depending on the standards you apply, I suppose, would be the determining factor as to how you answer that question. If you uh, attempt to apply God's standards to how to answer that question, you probably come up with a different answer. God, I think, would tell us that the greatness of a nation isn't measured by what it possesses, but by the character of its people. Not by what we have, but by who we are. By the character of its people as a whole. And certainly, that is supported by the book of Proverbs. This morning I want to suggest to you in answering this question that a nation is great when its people are righteous, secondly when its people give God his rightful place, and thirdly when its people accept and live by God's revelation, by God's revelation. So you have your Bible open to the 14th chapter of Proverbs, look at the last two verses, or the last uh, verse 34, almost to the very end of that chapter. Verse 34 of Proverbs 14, where we see that a nation is great when its people are righteous. Here's a typical contrast that we have seen as we've looked at the book of Proverbs. A statement and then a contrasting statement with that little word, but, between them, giving us this difference. In this case, a very huge difference. Righteousness, verse 34 says, exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Several of the verses that we look at today will be well known to us. This one probably is familiar. There is a ring of familiarity to that first part of that verse. Righteousness exalts a nation. We've heard that before. But sin is a disgrace to any people. Note again the contrast. Righteousness, of course, is that conformity to, to God's standard. It's whatever God says. It's whatever God declares. He is righteous. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 11 and verse 7, the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. <laughs> Not sure we appreciate that attribute about our God as we should. There are really only two standards that we have in the world. The standard that God has supplied and then whatever other standard we might want to accept. Our standard, someone else's standard. Some other standard besides the standard that God has given us. You recall back into the Old Testament, the stories of, of the scriptures. You come to that book of Judges, that amazing book of Judges, where we're told in the 25th, 24th, 20, 21st uh, chapter and the 25th verse that everyone was doing what they wanted to do, what was right in their own eyes. The verse goes like this. In those days, there was no king. Maybe we could... Tweak that verse a little bit and say, in those days there was no standard. There was certainly no standard 
that was accepted as God's standard for how people should live. So everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did their own thing. Everyone decided themselves what was right and what was wrong. Boy, is that described today or not? It sure does. Thousands of years have passed and yet very little has changed. We live in a world where people more or less have forgotten the standard that God has set, his revelation, and they have simply embraced their own standard. They determine what is right and wrong on all the issues that we face as a society. And yet God says there's only one right standard, and everyone and everything will be measured against it. And it's his standard. Notice it's this righteousness, it's God's standard, it's what he says is right and wrong that exalts a nation. God determines what exalts a nation. It's his righteousness. It's agreeing with him. It's doing what he has called us to do that that lifts a nation. That's the idea of the word exalts. To lift up, to raise up, to elevate. I, I think probably in this sense, in a moral sense, right? The verse is simply telling us that Living life according to the standard that God has set and has shared with us lifts a nation up morally. It's good for the people of that nation when they live according to God's standard. That's what the verse is saying. It's a very practical, a very practical verse. And then you have this huge contrast, of course, that tells us that unrighteousness, sin, disgraces that nation. Some would suggest to us that this verse maybe should be understood in the sense that this exaltation is uh, is speaking of of how the world then, how other nations will will view that people, how, how other nations will view that nation that is living according to God's standard. I'm not sure that's right because it seems to to go against the reality of what takes place in our world. I don't know if you noticed or heard, but uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned. Sure you heard, right? Everybody knows that Roe v. Wade was overturned. The Supreme Court made this decision. And yet, did you hear the response of the world? Was there applause that the United States was standing for life? No. There was ridicule. CNN reported that several of the United States' Western allies responded with anger and dismay at the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade on Friday, calling it horrific, appalling, and a big step backwards. That's what the world thinks of following God's standard. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said the move clearly has a massive impact on people's thinking around the world, calling it a very important decision. I've got to tell you, I think it is a big step backwards, he said. The news coming out of the United States is horrific, said the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. No government politician or man should tell a woman what she can do and cannot do with her body. How about God? Can Almighty God set the standard? Not according to him. I want women in Canada to know that we will always stand up for your right to choose. French uh, President Emmanuel Macron also expressed solidarity with women in the United States and called abortion a fundamental right for all women. Soon after, his foreign minister, Catherine Colonna, called the decision appalling. Now, this verse isn't telling us that when a nation follows the standard that God has declared is right, that the rest of the nations of the world will applause. That's not what the verse is telling us. It's telling us that the standard of right and wrong that God has determined, as we embrace that and live it out, it exalts, it lifts up that people. It lifts us up as a nation. It's morally good for us. It's the right thing to do. Why? Because that's the standard that God has set. And he determines what is right and what is wrong. Righteousness among a group of people has a beneficial effect. It lifts them up morally. And then conversely, sin, unrighteousness, is a disgrace to any people. The word disgrace kind of is a soft word, isn't it? It almost surprises us in this context. At least that's how we would use the word disgrace. Well, that's a disgrace. It's kind of a soft word. It's a gentle word. But in this context, it isn't such. It's a very strong and hard word. In fact, you'll only find this Hebrew word used two times in all of the Bible. 
You find it here in Proverbs 14. You'll find it again in Leviticus chapter 20 in the context of God speaking about incestuous relationships. It's a hard word. Just as that in Leviticus is a disgrace, so this is also a disgrace to the people if they abandon the standard that God has set. If they no longer embrace it, if they, if they no longer acknowledge what God has said and they go their own way and they do their own thing and they determine what is right and wrong. That's the nation in which we live. That's the world in which we live. That certainly would argue against calling the United States of America today a great nation. When people seem to be getting away with sin, ultimately what we find is it catches up with them. And it shames them. That's what this verse is telling us. It's a disgrace when you abandon the standard that God has set. And ultimately, of course, it doesn't lift you up. It tears you down. Some say, of course, that the United States of America, if it doesn't repent soon and turn from its sinful ways, well, God is going to judge it very harshly. I tell you that God is already judging the United States. We're living in those days right now. As his children, we are living in a nation that is under God's judgment. And that's very clear from Romans chapter 1. We have abandoned what God has told us to do. We have embraced uh, the very opposite of what he has said is right and good. We have, we have called that wrong. And we have embraced whatever we desire to embrace. That's, that's the mentality of our leaders. That's where we're at as a nation. You shouldn't, certainly wouldn't call us a Christian nation. In any sense of the word. We are a nation that has many Christians in it. But we are under the judgment of God today. Because this verse reflects us. Sin is a disgrace to any people. It's a disgrace to us as a nation. There's a, there's a second truth that comes through in these uh, verses that speaks to us of, of uh, how we might answer that question. A nation is great when its people are righteous, but Proverbs tells us that a nation is also great when its people give God his rightful place. When that people, when that nation, give God his rightful place in that nation. Gallup polling was recently done in the month of May of this year, and found, amazingly, that 81% of Americans believe in God. 81% of Americans, as a whole, believe in God, continuing a steep slide in belief in a higher power. That's not the God of the Bible. That's simply believe in God, believe in a higher power. 81% believe in a higher power. That's a rather attention-grabbing headline, isn't it? We're getting dangerously close to, to one-fourth of our nation not even embracing that God exists, that a higher power exists. The article went on and said there's more to the story, though as the Gallup poll provides several other data markers worth considering, out of those surveyed who do profess believe in God, 42% believe that he hears and intervenes on behalf of the individual. So 81% believe in God. Of those 81%, only half of them believe that God has any role in their life. That he answers prayer, that he hears, that he intervenes in some way on behalf of the individual. Only 30% of young adults, 18 to 29, hold that belief. 30%. Gallup notes that belief in God has dropped significantly, but not as significantly as religious metrics like church membership and church attendance, observing that the practice of religious faith may be changing more than basic faith in God. Well, how would Proverbs answer this question for us? It tells us very clearly that a nation is great when that nation gives God his rightful place. We see this from a number of verses in Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs chapter 21 where we see, um, in part, how Proverbs depicts our God. 
God raises and deposes kings. God directs the hearts of kings. And ultimately, he's the source of good, we're told in Proverbs. Look at Proverbs 21 and verses 30 and 31, the last two verses. These are the kinds of verses you almost would skip over because they aren't necessarily uh, readily understandable to us. But look carefully at them. Verse 30 says, There is no wisdom and no understanding and no counsel against the Lord. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. Verses 30 and 31. God raises and he lowers. He deposes kings and rulers, presidents, and those who would be placed in places of authority. Verse 30 essentially tells us that no one is wise or bright or clever who is opposed to the Lord and to his standard of living, to what he's told us to do. Human wisdom is no match against God's wisdom. There is no wisdom, there is no plan of any person that can ultimately thwart what God has planned. He is sovereign and he is wise. And so we get this kind of like an example then in verse 31. The horse is prepared for the day of battle. The tanks are all lined up. The armies are ready to go. The ruler thinks he's going to win. He's got a plan and he's going to carry it out. He's going to do as he wishes. But the last part of the verse says, but victory belongs to the Lord. God determines what a, what a nation is able to do and what a nation isn't able to do. What a ruler thinks he can do and what he can't do. And the greatest example of that maybe in the Old Testament is the nation of Egypt as Pharaoh came storming out of Egypt after the Hebrew people as they waded along the shore of the Red Sea. Only moments later to find themselves horses and chariots alike swimming in the waters of death. Why? Pharaoh thought this would be easy. He would swoop down and he would punish the Hebrew people for what they had done. But victory belongs to the Lord. He's the one that determines. Putin thought he would come into the Ukraine and do what he wanted to do. Victory belongs to God. He determines success and failure among the leaders of the world today. A nation is strongest when its confidence is simply in the power of a sovereign God who rules human history. And that's where our confidence has to be as a nation today. It certainly has, has people living in this world, but all the better if we can influence others to understand that same truth. There's a second verse in chapter 21 at the very beginning of that chapter which may be familiar to us as well. The very first verse of chapter 21 gives us another way to think about our God and to help us answer this question about whether we live in a great nation and whether this nation is giving God his rightful place. We would have to answer no based upon what we've seen so far. But here in verse 21 and verse 1, the New American Standard Bible says, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he wishes. When you were a kid, did you ever go out in the backyard and, or you go to the seashore and, and you make the tunnels in the dirt or in the sand and you allow the water to flow in and wherever you, wherever you curve that, that tunnel, that, that, uh, that passageway, well, that's where the water goes. Well, it's that simple little fun game. And that's a part, I think, of the picture of the, psalm, of, of the author of Hebrews as, or of uh, Proverbs as he writes here and says, the king's heart is exactly like that. God determines the channels in which the water will flow. He turns it wherever he wishes. You have so many biblical examples of this in the Old Testament scriptures. You go back to Ezra and Nehemiah and you come to King Artaxerxes. He played a huge role in allowing the Hebrew people to return back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and the walls of the city. King Artaxerxes, used by God in that way. Or in Daniel's day, Nebuchadnezzar or Darius, these individuals that thought, thought, thought so highly of themselves they were the ones who were in control. After all, they were, they were overseeing Babylon. And yet they were simply being used by God for his purposes. Or Ahasuerus in the book of Esther. All of these men and women of the past who found themselves in places of leadership, they simply are an example of what this verse teaches us. 
It may seem like, like kings and rulers and presidents of absolute power, but my friends, God, our God, is in control. And we need to take encouragement there. Proverbs teaches us that. And then thirdly, as you look at chapter 29, go to the end of the book of Proverbs or close to the end and come to the 26th verse. Here's a verse that simply tells us that God is the ultimate source of good. This is how we should understand God. Many seek the ruler's favor, it says, or maybe your Bible says face, or has the word face in the marginal reading, because that's the literal reading. Many seek the ruler's face. That is, they come before him seeking to get something from him, right? Whether it's a president or a king or a person in, 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 of influence or power, we would go to that person seeking our, our, our will to be done. May, may he or she agree with us. But we're told here, justice for man comes from the Lord. Ultimate justice comes from God. Why? Because he's good. And he's the only one that really knows what justice is. Everyone wants to take credit for good things that happen, of course. Ultimately, God says, the credit belongs to me because I am the sovereign God. And I exact justice. Wayne House writes and says the sovereignty of God doesn't encourage us to hold a fatalistic view of rulership. A leader must not have the careless attitude that actions do not matter because God will work everything out anyway. Rather, leaders should recognize the limited authority they have is always subject to the sovereignty of God. They must submit as well as they know how. To God's leading. Oh, for leaders that would understand that biblical truth. There's a third way that Proverbs answers this question. Is the United States a great nation? It would answer it by telling us that its people must be righteous. That its people must give God the rightful place in their lives. But all, thirdly, it tells us that the people must accept and live by God's revelation. Look at Proverbs 29. You're there. Look at verse 18. Again, here's one of these probably familiar verses. Depending on the translation you read today, it reads differently. The New American Standard Bible in verse 18 reads like this. Where there is no vision, the people are restrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. Again, there's the contrast there. You see the little word but. So you know the first phrase is in contrast to the second phrase. And that helps us actually to understand what is being said here. The word vision, if you have the King James Bible, um, well, it translates it this way. Where there is no vision, the people perish. This was a favorite verse years ago when the King James Bible was used to support the idea that churches, ministries in particular, needed to have a vision. And if it didn't have a vision, then the people perish. The verse says it. And so they would come to this verse over and over again and say, you have to know where you're going this year as a church or in your ministry. You have to have a five-year vision. You have to have a 10-year vision, a 20-year vision. What do you want God to do through you? And they pointed to this verse as proof that it was the case. But the verse says nothing about future planning. That's not what the verse is saying. That's why the New American Standard, in its uh, translation, where there is no vision, has a little number one next to that. And you look over in the marginal reading and it says literally, revelation. Where there is no revelation. Where, where God hasn't spoken, so the people understand what to do, the people perish. The people are unrestrained in their behavior is really what it's saying. Where we have turned our back on God's standard and we're doing our own thing, we do all these things that are inconsistent with what God has revealed. And so it's the revelation of God that we need to cling to, not our own plans, not our own hopes for the future. The vision here in this context must surely be the vision or the revelation that's given through the prophets to the to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. God's standards, God's will for them. What is it? Well, here it is. Will you embrace it or will you not? It tells us in the last part of the verse that the man who does so is happy. 
Happy is the one who keeps the law, who understands the revelation from God and is obedient to it. What a wonderful verse to help us to understand how to answer the question, what is a great nation? A great nation, a great people, is when that people accepts and lives by God's revelation. The, the verses are, are stating that without God's word, people abandon themselves to their own sinful ways. On the other hand, keeping it brings happiness. You know, as I think about the history of our nation, of course, my limited view of it, and what I understand has been a part of the last 250 plus years, is that we certainly are walking away from that biblical standard. I think there are certain biblical principles that have guided our nation. Whether you would argue or not that, that we ever were a Christian nation or not, we certainly were founded on Christian principles and, and, and understanding of, of God's revelation that made our country great, certainly in its early years. The principle of the dignity of human life probably stands at the top of that list but there are many others you would add. The traditional monogamous family, a husband and a wife, a mom and a dad, that's a home. Traditional monogamous family, commitment to, to common decency as we deal with other people around us, a strong work ethic, education that, that recognizes God instead of rejecting that God even exists. Basic understanding of authority, the list goes on and on. All of these were a part of our past. I don't find them in our present. We have abandoned those. I don't think we could say that the United States of America is a great nation today. We're experiencing the judgment of God. Well, what is our responsibility then? What are we to do? As a people of God who love the Lord, recognize, of course, who He is, and want to be obedient to him and used in this generation, what are we to do? Well, there's probably a number of things that might come to your mind. Let me suggest four as we close. Our responsibility is certainly to pray. I don't say that just because you expect it. I think the Word of God clearly tells us that we are to be a people of prayer. We are in a spiritual battle every day. And human weapons and human efforts will simply not be sufficient. I was reading this past week a, a, a book by Wayne House, in which he suggests there are a number of different ways we ought to be praying for those who are in authority over us. And I'm sure you do this, but we need to be faithful in doing it. He suggests we should be praying for their salvation, that they would come to faith in Jesus Christ, that they would understand the thing, same things that we've come to understand so that they would have that biblical worldview that would, that would guide and direct the decisions that they make that ultimately would be good for our people. He suggests that we pray for their safety. For in the 21st century, American political assassins have become all too common. Maybe not in the literal sense, but certainly figuratively. And then lastly, maybe a little surprisingly, he encourages us to pray that if leaders are wicked and ungodly, that God would remove them. However, he's so fit to remove them. That's a bold prayer. But as God's people seeking to represent him and knowing the truth and the standard by which we are to live today, those would be fitting prayers for God's people. We pray for our nation, for our leaders but of course, I think most importantly, as we do so, we find our hearts then begin to align with God's heart and we begin to see things from God's perspective. It's encouraging and helpful to us. Secondly, faithfully do what is right. Faithfully do what is right. I say that broadly and, and uh, simply because there are so many things that we should be doing that God has commanded us to do, that we should embrace as, uh, as His standard, as His will for our lives. Faithfully do what is right. Uh, knowing that we would be looking at these passages and this topic, oh, a couple of weeks ago I started to, to set aside various things that came across my desk that were 
usually by email or some information, something that was happening somewhere in our world that kind of gave a glimpse of what was happening in the United States of America, and I have 15 pages of things. Most of them profoundly sad, of course, as you reflect upon what's taking place in our country today. One of these, I think, came to the top of my thinking simply because maybe it's one of the more significant findings. This was um, an analysis, some research done by Arizona Christian University's Cultural Research Center in conjunction with George Barna, a name that some of you might recognize. And this particular study revealed a, a, a rather shocking absence of a biblical worldview among pastors of evangelical churches. Evangelical churches, by definition, of course, believe that the Bible is God's true and reliable words to humanity. The latest release of the American Worldview Inventory, conducted in February and March of this, re of this year, revealed that 37% of Christian pastors held a biblical worldview. Now, that should be understood in the, broadest, in the broadest way, right? These are Christian pastors, all denominations and, and, and types of churches. And so they looked deeper and they came to the conclusion that the numbers are only slightly better among pastors of evangelical and independent and non-denominational churches. It barely gets above 50%. Half of the churches, like Community Bible Church in our country, don't have a pastor or pastors that are leading them that have a biblical worldview. That number continues to decline. Attending what may be considered an evangelical church, Barna writes, no longer ensures a pastoral staff that has a high view of Scripture. The study continued, we're really not being the kind of light in the darkness that Christ has called us to be. American culture is doing more transforming of the American church. The report comes as the nation continues to reel from, from recent mass shootings in Texas, New York, and California. Historically, in times of tragedy, Americans look to the pulpit for answers. Fewer pulpits believe the Bible actually has the answers. If you want to know where our country is going, look no farther than that fact, my friend. Those who are supposed to be leading us morally, spiritually, in the direction that God has called us to go. Don't even embrace that direction. They conclude and say it also carries implications for believers seeking to join a healthy church. Barna said, if you're going to go to a church, it's incumbent upon you to do your homework to figure out, is this a church that not only believes the Bible and not just, and not just talks about it, but really is living it, really is being held accountable? He offers a warning. They're going to tell you they love the Bible, that they teach the Bible. We can no longer assume that is the case. Faithfully do what is right, my friends. God has called you to, to stand in the midst of a culture that is crumbling spiritually. The church of Jesus Christ, with his power and strength, can stand for what is right and can do what is right. Thirdly, be gracious to those who differ as you stand for the truth. Be gracious toward one another. We haven't done well in this. We've been ungracious toward unbelievers whose eyes are blind to the truth, and we can be equally as ungracious to our Christian brothers and sisters. Such should not be the case. Be gracious toward unbelievers and believers alike. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6 says, Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. Speaking about how we influence those who are outside the church. Yesterday went down to the farmer's market with the family. Saturday morning, kind of a fun thing to do. And here as we walk down the, the, the brick street there on 11th Street and Jackson, 
came to the end of the farmer's market, there was a young woman holding a sign. It said something about uh, LGBTQ, and then it asked a question at the bottom, you know, ask me a question about what I believe, or something like that. And I saw her standing there, and I thought, well, I'm going to go over and ask her. So I went over and engaged her in a conversation. It was very brief. I said, are you getting many people to come and talk to you? And she said, well, a few. She was very nice. And I said, I have to tell you that I'm on the other side of these issues. She was gracious back toward me. It's not really that difficult to do. Of course, it becomes more challenging if they're not being very gracious. It's hard. But God has called us, I think, to be loving toward those who don't understand the truth about the, the issues of our day. And through the Holy Spirit's work in our life, we certainly can do that. We can be gracious to those who will differ with us. And then lastly, number four, be encouraged. As you are reminded that God's, purpose for, God's purposes for our nation will be fulfilled. Whatever God has planned for the United States of America, that's what's going to happen, my friend. And no one can thwart that. No ruler can decide, well, I'm going to take it a different direction. God has determined what he will do through the United States. That's determined, and it will be fulfilled because he is a sovereign God. Um, Mark Hitchcock, in, in a number of his uh, books on prophecy, writes about the fact that the United States doesn't seem to be anywhere in prophetic Scripture. When you think about Old and New Testament passages, there doesn't seem to be any references to the United States. Not everybody embraces that understanding. But I think that's accurate. That the Bible simply doesn't tell us what's going to happen to our nation in the years ahead. So Mark Hitchcock offers some options. Option number one is that America will still be powerful in those last days, but the Lord simply chooses not to mention specifically the United States in the Scriptures. That seems very unlikely. That we would be a, a leading power or maybe the greatest nation in terms of military strength in the world and we would not be a part of those end times when all the nations of the world gather. That seems really hard to, to embrace. Option number two is America isn't mentioned specifically because she will be destroyed by another nation. There's only one way that I can see that happening. And that's through nuclear war. It's hard to imagine that a nation would, would be able to successfully invade our country and conquer it. But nuclear war is a reality in which we live today. The third option is that America is not mentioned in Bible prophecy because she will have lost her influence as a result of moral and spiritual decline. We are falling from inside. We're not going to be conquered from outside. Mark Hitchcock actually embraces a fourth option in which he says America will become a third-rate nation overnight at the rapture. And the rapture takes place millions and millions of believers in this country, unlike probably any other country in the world, will be snatched away. And the United States will become a third world nation overnight. Millions of home mortgages will go unpaid. The stock market will crash. Millions of productive workers will be suddenly removed from the workforce. We'll be gone. I don't know what the Lord has in mind for the United States. But I know that whatever his sovereign plan is, it will be fulfilled. And for that, we can be encouraged. We can know that God's plan will be accomplished. Let's pray. Father, we pray for our nation. And Father, we, we recognize that, that in these days of moral decline, when we have rejected your standard and simply gone our own way, when we have called what is wrong right, that we as a nation simply are not great. That you've called us as your people to live in the midst of that decaying culture to stand for the truth. And so give us courage to do that. Give us graciousness to do that in a way that would be fitting for a child of God. 
Father, we pray for those that give leadership to us. There are many in our nation who serve in a place nationally or locally who, who know who you are. They are a child of God. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ, and they are in places of great influence and power. And we pray for their protection. We pray for, for wisdom for them as they make decisions, for we know that the Word of God tells us that when we follow your ways, it lifts up a nation. And so we pray that even at this stage in our country's history, we might find our way forward in a way that would be pleasing to you. But Father, whatever your plans are, for our children and our grandchildren in the years ahead, we pray that as your people, we would stand for the truth. We would do so in a way that would be honoring to you. Give us courage. Give us an understanding of what you have already shared with us in your revelation so that we might be able to do exactly as you have told us. And Father, guide us by your Spirit. Thank you for his work in our hearts and minds. May we be sensitive to what he would call us to do each day in the unique and individual circumstances that we face as individuals. May you guide and direct our steps. And may we be faithful to live in a way that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. I'm going all in. kingdom come and i want to hear you say welcome home my child well done.